The excitement had been building for weeks, ever since I booked what looked like the perfect Airbnb for a weekend getaway with my friends. The pictures promised a charming cottage nestled on the edge of the woods, quaint and secluded, just what we needed to escape our bustling city lives. As we pulled up that late evening, the tires crunching softly on the gravel, something felt terribly off. The house before us bore little resemblance to the warm, inviting photos online. It stood dark and dilapidated, its windows grimy and unwelcoming, the porch sagging as if bearing too many secrets. Despite our confusion and growing apprehension, we decided to venture inside, hoping the interior might reveal a more accurate reflection of our expectations. Once inside, the disconnect only deepened. The air was stale, and a thin layer of dust covered everything, contradicting the recently cleaned description from the listing. As we moved cautiously from room to room, the light from our phones revealed more inconsistencies. A coffee cup sat on the counter, a ring of residue in its curve, a clear sign it hadn't been abandoned for long. Magazines, not more than a month old, were scattered on a table. Every detail screamed that someone had been living here, and recently. My heart thudded uncomfortably in my chest, the thrill of our little adventure souring quickly into dread. The eerie feeling intensified with every step we took through the decrepit house. My friends and I whispered about leaving, unease gnawing at our resolve, when Alex, always the brave one, pushed open a door to what looked like a small, cluttered office. The room was cramped and musty, but what froze us in our tracks was not the moldy smell. It was the glow of monitors lined up against one wall, each displaying different parts of the house. We're on camera, Alex muttered his voice a mix of anger and fear. Our faces, pale and drawn, stared back at us from the screens. Someone had been watching us since we arrived, monitoring our every move. Panic set in as we realized the full extent of our vulnerability. Rattled but determined, we began a frantic search for another way out, avoiding the prying digital eyes. In a locked drawer, which Jenna managed to pry open, we found a stash of photos and notes. My stomach dropped as I recognized myself in many of the pictures, some taken over recent months. Notes detailing my routines, my hangouts, even conversations I thought were private, were scrawled alongside the images. The stalker had been shadowing me long before this supposed getaway. The air thickened with danger as we acknowledged the depth of my stalker's obsession. We needed to leave, and quickly. But as we gathered our things, we realized our phones were nowhere to be found likely taken by the stalker to prevent us from calling for help. Determined not to be victims, we scrambled to arm ourselves. In the garage, we found a rusty crowbar, a heavy wrench, and a box of nails that could be used as makeshift weapons. Our hands shook as we gripped our scant armory, the weight of the metal cold and somewhat reassuring against our palms. With weapons in hand and hearts racing, we strategized our escape. The front door was too obvious, likely watched or rigged, Instead, we opted for a less conspicuous back window in the kitchen, which overlooked a neglected part of the yard shrouded in shadows. We decided we'd break the window and run into the woods, hoping to reach the road and flag down a passing car. Every creak and rustle of the old house put us on edge as we prepared to enact our plan. We weren't just fighting to escape the house now. We were fighting to escape a nightmare that had apparently been unfolding long before tonight. Our breaths were shallow, hearts pounding as we moved toward the kitchen, ready to make our escape. The old window frame groaned under Jenna's efforts as she worked to pry it open. That's when we heard the front door click and swing open. Instinctively, we froze, our makeshift weapons clutched tightly. He stepped into the hallway, a tall, shadowy figure, with a presence that filled the room with dread. I recognized him instantly from a coffee shop I frequented, always just a background character. Now he was the antagonist in our real-life horror story. Sarah, he called out, his voice eerily calm. I knew you'd come. I've been waiting. Alex stepped forward, crowbar raised, but the stalker's focus remained intensely on me, as if my friends were just blurred outlines in his vision. You don't understand, Sarah, he continued, taking a step closer. We are meant to be together. I've watched you, learned everything about you. You're perfect. His attempt to isolate me from my friends by moving closer, his eyes fixated unnervingly on me, 
only heightened the terror. But his presence galvanized us into action. Jenna shouted for us to run while Alex and Mark positioned themselves between me and the stalker, ready to defend us at all costs. The tension snapped like a wire. The stalker lunged, and the chaos erupted. In the ensuing chaos, our survival instincts took over. Mark and Alex tackled the stalker, grappling with him just long enough for Jenna and me to push a heavy, teetering bookshelf toward them. With a tremendous crash, it toppled, pinning the stalker beneath a heap of books and wooden shelves. His groans echoed in the sudden silence that followed our frenzied action. Jenna quickly patted down the stalker's jacket, her fingers finding the bulge of a phone. She dialed 911 with trembling hands. Her voice relayed our location and situation to the dispatcher. We knew help was on the way, but the minutes it would take for them to arrive stretched before us like hours. We can't just wait here. He might get free, Alex said, his face set with determination. We nodded, splitting up to create diversions and make it harder for the stalker to target any one of us if he escaped his makeshift trap. The house transformed into a shadowy labyrinth as we dashed through its corridors, our footsteps muffled by the thick dust and decay. I ducked into a closet, heart hammering, as I heard the distant shuffling of the stalker trying to free himself. Jenna circled back to the main hall to keep an eye on him, while Mark crept through the back rooms to ambush the stalker if he broke free. The game of cat and mouse escalated with every passing second, our breaths loud in our ears, punctuated by the distant sirens that promised salvation. The stalker's cunning was evident as he used his knowledge of the house's layout to his advantage, attempting to outmaneuver us despite his injuries. We communicated in hushed tones, coordinating our movements and staying alert to any sound that might indicate he was on the move. Every creak of the floorboards, every rustle from the other rooms, tightened the knot of anxiety in our chests. We were trapped in a deadly game within the decaying walls of the fake Airbnb, each moment unfolding with unbearable tension as we awaited the arrival of the police, hoping we could hold out until they breached the threshold of this nightmare. The blaring sirens grew louder, cutting through the tense silence of the house like a lifeline. I peered from my hiding spot, my heart pounding, as blue lights flashed through the grimy windows. The stalker was close, his breathing ragged and furious. Just as he reached for the closet door where I was concealed, the front door burst open. Police officers flooded into the room, their commands loud and authoritative. In moments, they had the stalker handcuffed, his eyes wild and unyielding, met mine one last time as they led him away. Relief washed over me, mingled with a deep, unsettling fear. My friends and I gathered together, our arms around each other, finding comfort in the presence of law enforcement. We were safe now, the immediate danger over, but the shadows of what had occurred clung to us, a haunting reminder of our vulnerability. As we finally left the nightmare behind, the cold night air felt like freedom, but back at the safety of my own home, I reached into my jacket pocket and pulled out a note. See you soon, Sarah. The chilling words twisted my newfound relief into dread. Was it really over? It was just past midnight when Liam and I finally found the Airbnb after hours of driving through winding back roads. The GPS signal had flickered uncertainly for the last half hour and each turn into the dense forest seemed more foreboding than the last. Our headlights swept across the old two-story house that stood secluded, surrounded by an unrelenting darkness that the porch light barely penetrated. The place looked like it hadn't seen visitors in ages, with its weather-beaten facade and overgrown path leading to the front door. As Liam pulled up, I couldn't shake off a creeping sense of unease, the kind that makes the hairs on the back of your neck stand up. With our luggage in tow, we approached the house, the sound of our steps crunching on the gravel path breaking the eerie silence. Liam fished out the key from his pocket, which the host had left in a lockbox under the porch light, and opened the front door. We were expecting the musty, closed-up smell of an unused rental, but instead, the scent of freshly cooked food hit us. Confused, we stepped inside, only to find a scene that seemed straight out of a family dinner. There, in what seemed to be the living room, was a family of four, two adults and two children, curled up on the couch with a movie playing softly on the television. They looked up, just as startled by our entrance as we were by their presence. Can I help you? The man asked, 
an edge of protectiveness in his voice as he stood up, his stance wary. I think there might be some mistake, Liam replied, holding up the key. We booked this place for the weekend. Are you... are you leaving tonight? Egg. The woman exchanged a worried glance with the man before turning back to us. No, we just got here this afternoon, she said, her voice tense. We're booked through till Monday. There must be some mistake. Liam and I exchanged a look of disbelief. The awkwardness in the air thickened as each group insisted on their legitimate claim to the Airbnb. The night, already dark and unsettling, seemed to close in on us, as if waiting to see what we would do next in this unexpected turn of events. The tension in the room ratcheted up a notch, as the father, his brows knotted in suspicion, accused us of foul play. We were warned about this, he said, his voice steady but filled with accusation. We got messages saying that some people would try to take over our booking, pretending to be guests. Who are you really? I felt my stomach twist in confusion and fear. We're just here for a weekend away, I insisted, trying to keep my voice calm as I showed him the confirmation email on my phone. Look, here's our booking confirmation. We got it directly from the host. The mother still seated kept her eyes on us, clutching her youngest close. It was clear they were frightened, and so were we. Liam, trying to defuse the situation, suggested, Maybe there's been some sort of mistake with the booking system. Could we all perhaps just call the host and sort this out? As the adults talked, one of the children, a girl about eight years old, tugged on her father's sleeve. Daddy, are they the bad people from the messages? This prompted the father to recount the odd messages they had received over the past week, warnings about imposters who would claim the reservation was theirs. The timing coincided eerily with their own booking confirmation. We listened, horrified. Neither Liam nor I had received any such warnings, just the usual booking details and a code for the key lockbox. With nowhere to go in the dead of night and the family clearly as legitimate as us, a reluctant truce was formed. We agreed to share the space for the night, each of us taking a floor. The living room's uneasy silence was eventually broken as we all gathered around the kitchen table, sharing our reservation details and trying to piece together the discrepancies in the host's communications. The father, whose name was Eric, showed us his messages. They were from the same email address as ours, but the tone was urgent, almost fearful, hinting at a need to protect his family from potential harm. Meanwhile, our communications were standard and businesslike, devoid of any such warnings. As we talked, it became apparent that we were all victims of some greater scheme, possibly orchestrated by the host. The realization that we were not each other's enemies, but rather allies against a common threat slowly changed the atmosphere from one of suspicion to collaborative determination. We decided to search for any more clues in the house that might explain what was happening. Little did we know, the night had more secrets to unveil, and the true antagonist was not amongst us, but orchestrating from the shadows. Late into the night, as we attempted to coexist under the strange and tense circumstances, our phones simultaneously lit up with new messages. The timing was uncanny, sending a chill down my spine. Both groups, wary and exhausted, gathered around the dim light of our screens in the dimly lit kitchen. The message was from the host, and the words sent a wave of cold dread through me. For your own safety, do not trust the other guests. They are not who they say they are. Protect yourselves. Liam and I exchanged a frightened glance, our previous feelings of solidarity shaken. Eric and his wife, Helen, looked equally disturbed, their eyes darting between their children and us with newfound suspicion. The atmosphere thickened with paranoia, each of us mentally revisiting every odd detail of the evening, wondering if we had overlooked a warning sign. Why would he send this? Liam whispered, voicing the dread coiling in my gut. What's he trying to do? No one had the answer. Each group retreated to opposite ends of the room, our minds racing. The uneasy alliance we had formed was fracturing under the weight of fear and mistrust, driven by the host's cryptic and menacing warnings. As the night deepened, so did our sense of isolation and peril, trapped in a game we didn't understand, played by a host who seemed to be pulling all the strings. After hours of unease and whispered discussions, both groups, 
fueled by a desperate need for answers, decided to come together once more. With hesitant steps, we agreed to search the house for any clues that might explain the host's strange behavior and disturbing messages. Our search led us to a locked room upstairs, which we had assumed was just a private area off limits to guests. But the recent events, charged with suspicion and fear, pushed us to break in. The door gave way under the collective effort, revealing what was unmistakably the host's personal quarters. But it was the contents of the room that caught us all off guard. Papers were strewn about, featuring multiple IDs and documents with different names, and detailed plans outlining various scenarios of staged robberies and insurance claims. It was a goldmine of deceit. While we were still processing the magnitude of the fraud, the sound of a car pulling up to the house sliced through the silence. Panic set in as we realized it was the host. He entered the house, his expression darkening as he found us in his private sanctuary, surrounded by his secrets laid bare. What are you doing? He demanded, his voice dangerously calm. Liam stepped forward, holding up some of the incriminating documents. You've been setting us up. Why? For insurance money. The host's facade cracked, a sinister smile spreading across his face as he confessed. It's easy money, he said. Stage a little drama. File a claim for stolen property and no one's the wiser. You would have just been another police report. His admission was cold, calculated. But as he took a step towards us, presumably to physically intimidate us into silence, Eric dialed the police discreetly from his phone. The host noticed too late to stop him. You think the police will believe you over me? I've done this before. The host sneered, his confidence unshaken. But as the sirens began to wail in the distance, his smirk faltered. The reality of his situation began to sink in. We all stood, united by the threat against us, as the host realized his plans were unraveling fast. The story he had so carefully orchestrated was coming to an end, but this time, he wasn't holding the pen. As the host's demeanor grew increasingly menacing, a sense of urgent survival instinct kicked in among us. We whispered a hasty plan while the host was momentarily distracted by the approaching sirens. Moving swiftly, Liam and Eric lunged forward, grappling with him in a desperate bid to restrain his movements. Utilizing our brief advantage, Helen and I rushed to help, pushing him back into his cluttered room. With combined effort, we slammed the door shut and turned the key, locking him inside. His muffled shouts of rage were drowned out by the sound of police sirens growing louder, a reassuring sign of impending help. We didn't pause to catch our breath. Instead, grabbing the children and our essential belongings, we hurried out of the house. As we emerged into the cool night air, the flashing lights of police cars painted the scene with stark, red and blue strokes of reality. We were safe, for now, but the echo of what we had just experienced would linger far longer. We stood outside, recounting everything to the police, a mix of relief and disbelief washing over us. But later, as I reached into my purse for my phone, a slip of paper fluttered out, a note with chilling words. See you at your next check-in. Shaken, I opened my email to find a new booking confirmation for a location we never reserved, sent from the same host. The truth was clear. This nightmare was far from over. We turned off the main road onto a narrow lane, the GPS announcing our arrival at the Airbnb. Nestled among towering pines, the quaint cottage seemed a picture-perfect escape from the relentless pace of our city lives. This looks just like the photos, Maya remarked her voice tinged with relief and excitement. I nodded, parking the car as dusk painted the sky in strokes of purple and gold. Maya and I, both seasoned in the world of digital security, were looking forward to a weekend devoid of tech crises. As we unloaded our bags and stepped inside, the charm of the rustic exterior extended into a cozy, well-furnished interior. But as a security expert, I couldn't shake off a nagging feeling as I noticed things slightly amiss. A mirror oddly angled towards the shower, a digital photo frame positioned directly opposite the bed. Our curiosity turned to alarm when, on closer inspection, we discovered these were not mere decor misplacements, but cleverly disguised cameras. The realization hit us hard. Our supposed sanctuary was a stage with us unwittingly, the stars. 
With professional calm, we assessed the situation. Clearly, the serene getaway was anything but. Our discovery of the hidden cameras ignited a fire of indignation and urgency. As digital security experts, Tom and I were well equipped to handle this breach of privacy, yet the blatant violation shook us. Calming our initial shock, we switched to professional mode, determined to uncover the full scope of the intrusion. I began cataloging each camera while Tom initiated a network scan from his laptop. What have you got? I asked, peering over his shoulder. It's worse than we thought, Tom murmured, his eyes narrowing at the screen. These cameras are streaming live. There's a server here collecting data. It's not just local storage. It's being pushed online. The air between us charged with a new layer of dread. Tom quickly isolated the server's IP and began tracing its connections. What we uncovered next was a horrifying network of data flow, archived footage and live streams funneling into the dark corners of the web. The reality that we were likely being broadcast to a hidden audience turned my stomach. This guy's making money off this, Tom said, disgust evident in his tone. We were just the latest in what looked like a long line of victims. Fueled by a mix of fear and anger, we plotted our next moves. I started documenting every piece of hardware and its location within the house, while Tom worked to break further into the network. Using our expertise, we managed to access the host's sales logs and customer interactions on the dark web. Each file we uncovered added weight to our case against him. We need to expose him, I declared, and ensure he can't do this to anyone else. Tom nodded, his face set in a grim line. Let's take all the evidence we can and shut down his operations. We'll need to alert the authorities. But first, let's make sure he has no way to continue this business. We spent the next hours systematically dismantling his surveillance network. I took screenshots and downloaded logs while Tom wrote a script to scrub the data from the server remotely once we were safe. We also prepared a detailed report on the host's activities, ready to hand over to law enforcement. As we worked, our professional detachment gave way to a personal resolve. We were not just reclaiming our privacy, but standing up for unseen, unknowing victims like us. Our plan was clear. Secure the evidence, expose the host, and use our skills to protect future guests from falling prey to such vile invasions of privacy. As we prepared for the confrontation call, Tom and I rehearsed our roles. The plan was simple. Pretend ignorance while subtly probing the host's awareness and complicity. We opted to claim a non-existent issue with the Wi-Fi as our cover. I dialed the number, my heart beat a steady drum in my ears, while Tom stood by with a notepad ready to jot down any slips or confirmations. The phone rang twice before a cheerful voice answered, the warmth in his tone a stark contrast to the cold dread churning in my stomach. Hi, this is Emmy. We're having some trouble with the Wi-Fi connection, I began, injecting a note of frustration into my voice. Could you help us out? Of course, Emmy. I'm sorry about that. The host replied smoothly. But just to confirm, you're calling from the living room, right? Near the router on the bookshelf? His unwitting reference to the exact location of one of the hidden cameras caught him off guard. I pressed on, masking my shock with annoyance. Yes, exactly. It's been really inconsistent. He chuckled, a sound that now seemed sinister. You know, those devices can be finicky. Just give it a tap. Sometimes that's all it needs, right on top where the little blue light is. The blue light wasn't on any standard router. It was on the hidden camera. His casual instruction confirmed his awareness and his intent. Tom and I exchanged a glance, the gravity of the situation sinking in further. We had him. Thanks, I'll try that, I said, keeping my voice light while wrapping up the call. As soon as I hung up, Tom and I knew the stakes had just escalated. The host wasn't just complicit. He was actively directing us, confirming his direct involvement in the surveillance setup. This slip was exactly what we needed to move forward with our plan to expose and stop him. Leveraging our expertise in digital security, we swiftly moved to lock the host out of his own surveillance network. Tom's fingers flew over the keyboard as he implemented layers of encryption, effectively barring the host from accessing his own system. Simultaneously, I started purging the server of its invasive content, deleting files that contained hours of secretly recorded footage. Got something here, Tom murmured, 
his eyes narrowing as he scrolled through a live chat on the host's network. He's chatting with someone about coming back to fix an unexpected issue. He's on his way here. The urgency of the situation escalated. We needed to be ready. As we prepared for his arrival, I positioned myself near the front door, ready to confront him, while Tom discreetly dialed the local police, explaining the situation in hushed tones. The air thickened with tension as we heard a car pull up. Moments later, the door swung open to reveal the host, his face contorted with rage. What have you done to my system? He bellowed, stepping aggressively towards the laptop. I think the bigger question is what you've been doing with these cameras. I retorted, my voice steady despite the pounding of my heart. I managed to keep him engaged, forcing him to explain his actions, stalling for time as Tom communicated with the police on his phone, kept out of the host's sight. The host's anger surged as he attempted to push past me to reach his equipment. You have no right to touch my things. Before he could get any further, the sound of sirens filled the room, and police officers burst through the door. They quickly assessed the situation, their trained eyes taking in the open laptop with its streams of code and the visible tension. Hands where I can see them, one officer commanded. The host, caught mid-movement, his face a mask of fury and panic, complied reluctantly as they moved to handcuff him. Everything's recorded, officers, Tom announced, stepping forward. We've got all the evidence of what he's been doing. As the police took over, securing the host and beginning their investigation, relief washed over me, mingled with a profound sense of vindication. As we left the scene, my phone pinged with a notification of a file transfer initiated days before our arrival, chillingly hinting at the host's connections to a broader, darker network. The realization that this ordeal might be a mere glimpse into a much larger scheme lingered ominously as we drove away the weight of unresolved danger hanging between us. 